Thank you for joining us. I'm Nancy Furness, and this is We've Got Issues. And We've Got Issues is a nonpartisan, citizens-based forum where we talk about issues of interest to the Tri-Cities. I'd like to thank Tri-Cities Community Television for allowing these interviews to go ahead. And before we get started, I'd also like to acknowledge that our interview today is taking place on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of Coquitlam First Nation. So we thank the Coquitlam people who continue to live on these lands and care for the lands and the waters and all that lies above and below. So today we are joined by Kyla Knowles, who is taking a run for Port Moody City Council. So thank you so much for joining us today, Kyla. Thanks for having me, Nancy. I was wondering if maybe we could start with just learning a little bit about who you are. If you could give us a bit of background, tell us about yourself and why you're running for Port Moody City Council. Sure, I'd love to, thank you. Uh, so I grew up up north, northern BC, in a, very, in a community very much like Port Moody, on the ocean, surrounded by mountains and forests. And that is, um, something I grew to appreciate. So when I saw Port Moody, when I moved down to the Lower Mainland in 1994 to go to SFU, I thought, oh, I'm going to live here one day. And um, ah. when I was pregnant with my second child, um, my now ex and I uh, found a place in Port Moody that we could afford, and we moved in 2013. So I've been uh, in Port Moody since then, and I, I just love it. Um, I'm passionate about uh, having the city succeed. Um, my husband and I are, are now split. We separated in 2018. Um, so we share custody. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just as a single mom kind of navigating those years, 2018 to mm -hmm. say 2020, 2021, it was a bit, of, you know, it was a struggle. And, um, but, you know, I've always been a, a hard worker. And, um, you know, I managed to buy him out of our townhouse. And um, he lives nearby. As I mentioned, we share custody. And I really wanted, you know, this opportunity. When I when I witnessed what's been happening in Port Moody the last few years, um, you know, I feel like there are some voices that aren't being heard. Um, it was tough to watch. You know, I've, I think I've watched probably every single council meeting in the last year and a half from beginning to end. I'm not saying something because I go till two o'clock in the morning sometimes. And, you know, I noticed a lot of people at public input and public hearings, you know, expressing frustration or, or needs. And I just feel like they're maybe not being heard. And um, I'm one of those people. I've called into council several times. Mm -hmm. And um, it hasn't been the greatest experience. So I want to help kind of create and rebuild Port Moody into something that uh, I think my girls would appreciate and respect and see their mother, you know, doing this political work mm -hmm. as well, um, in addition to my day job, in addition to taking right. care of them. <laughs> um, but, you know, I enjoy it. And like I said, I'm passionate about the city and I think I think we can do better. So you were saying that you feel that there are some voices that are not being heard, including um, some issues that, that you've brought up or that you're aware of as well. Mm -hmm. Who's not being heard? Like, what are those issues that are not being addressed? So, um, as anybody who's been paying attention to Port Moody politics knows, um, in the last campaign, um, there was a slate that ran um, with the majority. So that slate was elected, and essentially, you know, just the way votes work, you know, six councillors, one mayor. Um, when sorry, when you say slate, what mm -hmm. are you, what are you referring oh, to? Oh, sure. Like, so Ooh. it's like-minded individuals who kind of ran together, um, often on the same brochures, on the same flyers, so they appeared together and presented themselves as a cohesive uh, team of people. So for example, if you're familiar with Vancouver politics, it's almost completely slates, and they're mm -hmm. called ABC Slate or Vision Vancouver or NPA. Um, that is something that we hadn't normally seen out here in the Tri-Cities uh, in the past. So uh, when that happened, um, it was a bit different, but you know they, they ran on with some really compelling arguments. And the four of them, this majority slate, I, there may have been others that weren't elected, um, uh, were all elected to council. So the problem, in my opinion, the mm -hmm. slate, um, is that it's, it's easy to fall into kind of dogmatic patterns of voting along with the slate without considering individual opinions. Um, the, it's for this reason I'm running as an independent candidate, right. and um, I really wish we'd kind of do away with the slates. To be honest, out here, I think there's more likelihood of individual voices being heard, being considered, um, 
if each counselor feels that they have the ability and the freedom to speak and vote as they like. Right, and I, I wasn't aware that there was a slate. I know sometimes um, candidates share resources and things as well, mm -hmm. but that's not quite the same as, as a slate. Right. Um, so can you tell me, mm -hmm. if you are successful on getting onto Port Moody City Council, what would be some of your priorities? If you can just you know, give us a couple of points of your maybe top three priorities. Sure. Um, fiscal responsibility and accountability, definitely. Okay. Um, good governance. Um, my background is in both uh, finance budgeting and governance. Um, and then, of course, affordability, not just housing affordability, but affordability period, and that ties back into financial accountability. And then um, parkland and climate change initiatives. Okay, so we've got lots to talk about. <laughs> Sounds like you also have lots of issues, like just like we do. We've all got issues. <laughs> um, so let's talk, let's start with fiscal responsibility. Mm -hmm. So what, where are we not being fiscally responsible and what would you like to see happen? Okay, so Port Moody, as we all know, is, you know, relatively small population size and mm -hmm. geographically. Right. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about not extending further sprawl up our mountains and into our forests, um, which means we're kind of uh, we're kind of deadlocked in terms of if we're going to grow at all and meet our um, commitments to Metro Vancouver, mm -hmm. how are we going to do that? How are we going to increase our tax base um, without impacting the environment right. around us, right? So the problem with that is we've lost two major industrial tenants in the last five years, and those were major tax-paying um, businesses to us. So the problem is now residents are shouldering the tax burden. The city of Port Moody is currently $23 million in debt. Okay. Um, is that unusual for a city? Like, I, very. So okay. it's, uh, cities aren't normally allowed to run deficits at all. So we, we haven't run a deficit, but we've had to borrow money from the province. The province has now cut us off. We're, they're, the bank of the province is closed. Okay. I mean, if you compare us to, say, Coquitlam, they've got about $100 million in the bank for rainy days. Burnaby, which I understand is a completely different story based on their size. Um, you know, they've got about $800 million. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, right? Yeah. So I think that should, though, concern everybody that, you know, we don't have any money put away in case of a major mm -hmm. emergency or, um, you know, even our COVID funding that was um, given to us by the government during COVID was just put into regular operations. So, I mean, uh, so we have no reserves other than those that are already budgeted, and that means that our taxes uh, as residents are increasing yearly. Uh, I've been doing a lot of door knocking in the last couple of weeks, and, you know, I knocked on the door of a gentleman and his wife who just moved into a townhouse in, Cook in Port Moody from a single-family residential in Burnaby. And he said, you know, we, we downgraded. Why are my taxes twice here what they were in Burnaby? Mm. And, you know, it's a tough question to answer, right? It, it's a tough question, but at the <clears> same time, it isn't. It, it's quite clear. But I mean, it's a tough question to have to, to answer. Have to, absolutely. Like, it, so it's awkward. You're saying that um, the business tax base is mm -hmm. uh, not supporting, it's not large enough to support Port Moody and that residents are, are shouldering that burden. Mm -hmm. How can we change that? How can we... Um, maybe encourage businesses to come to Port Moody? So, you know, there are a number of things we can do, and it's not just encouraging businesses. It's, in, it's diversifying our income stream generally, right? Okay. And that can be through different ways. It can be through um, uh, moderate development. It can be through encouraging businesses. It can be through cutting, um, cutting the budget in some areas. Right. Uh, there are a lot of ways that we can um, look at doing that. So are there areas that you think um, could be or should be cut to make those funds available? Uh, I do. Uh, and a lot of those focus kind of on council, which is part of the reason I'm running for council this okay. year. So I found that, for example, consultant costs, uh, those have gone up 70% in the last four years. it has been a lot of independent reports and councillor-generated reports um, that weren't particularly necessary. I mean, uh, an example of that is there was a traffic study done for the Coronation Park proposal, um, but you know the key members of council didn't like that study, so they wanted to do another one, and that's at our that's at our cost. So I really feel like there needs to be someone <laughs> on council, or at least on staff, that that you know put their foot down and say, no, it's been done. Yeah. This is what we're going to do. Um, but yeah, it's the it's the 
consultant reports, it's um, these lengthy staff meetings we're having. I mean, every time a meeting goes till two in the morning, we're paying lengthy staff overtime costs for mm -hmm. people to be there. So it, things like that seem very wasteful to me. So do you have some ideas how, how that could be changed? Well, I think, <laughs> Well, I think, for, exa for example, um, fewer generate counselor generated reports coming okay. forward and surveys and, and questionnaires. Can I just clarify, is, sure. are those um, consultant generated reports, is that what is considered as public consultation or is that something else? That's something else. So okay. if we want, say, a consultant to help us look at the tree canopy mm -hmm. in Port Moody, so I'm on the Parks and Rec um, Commission right now. And we can talk about that. In yeah, a we can talk about that. Um, and so we recently uh, commissioned a report on tree canopy in okay. Port Moody, right? So that's something that we're we're paying for. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of complaints from residents talking about the Engage Port Moody portal. Um, there was a survey that went out regarding the OCP that was cost us a hundred thousand okay. dollars but only 100 residents responded. So that's a cost of $1,000 per resident. And I'm just not sure that that's an effective use of our funds. So how can, how can the public be engaged? Like only 100 people responding to something like that. How can that be changed? Like how can you, or how would you as a counselor reach out to the community to make sure that people mm -hmm. are engaged? Well, currently what we're doing right now is obviously not working, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I know, and this isn't on city staff at all, St city staff works hard to get the word out by public hearings and right. by mail outs and on the websites. Um, so I don't really have the answer to that, but I can tell you, we know from experience now that the kind of expenditures we're making to get this information yeah. is not serving us well. And when you have those, you know, that few number of respondents, it, it's not good information, right? We've, Port Moody has a population of, I think, 35,000 people. Mm -hmm. 100 respondents is um, not, representative, not of representative of the community. community. And that's a huge issue, I think, across the municipalities and um, to try and get people engaged. Like yes. for our municipal elections, we see like three quarters of the people don't even come out and vote. So yeah. it's a bigger issue for sure, how mm -hmm. to how to raise that level of awareness and interest in what's going on in oh, the community, 100%. right? So um, I think you've also brought up parks mm -hmm. and green spaces and trees, and, yes. and that's an area that is of particular interest to me. Um, so I'm wondering, do you think, does Port Moody have enough parks and green spaces? So Port Moody it has more than 40 parks currently, right? Um, we've got huge, we've got beautiful, huge Burt Flynn, we've got Rocky Point, mm -hmm. and, a com and a study recently struck, a subcommittee of the Parks and Rec Commission, um, recently completed a study that showed that actually, yes, Port Moody does have enough parkland. Okay. Um, it's, it's an interesting study, it's publicly available if you want to take a look at it. What I found most interesting, though, about the, that study is that it identified, well, first of all, it determined we don't need any new parkland. Right. Second of all, it did determine, okay, well, if we were to look at new parkland, we should look at, you know, acquiring parkland where possible in the areas that are currently underserved. So, and th those are, there are five areas that were identified in that report. And absolutely, I, I'm really in favor of kind of activating our current neighborhood parks for more use. Right. I live in East Hill and we've got a, the most adorable little park beside us. It's got a water park. Nobody ever comes to it, right? Oh. It's got a huge field that it, it is never used. Um, and I, you know, when I talk to people about it, they've never even heard of it. So how can we activate the parks that we already have, take pressure off Rocky mm -hmm. Point, and also save money in the process, right? right. Like we, we don't have a lot of money. Well, we have no money <laughs> right. to purchase uh, additional parkland, especially parkland that's uh, private property, right? So let's use the resources that we have with the parks that we have. And if, and I certainly believe, however, um, if any public lands were available, and I understand that councillors um, Lati and Dilworth are considering a new signature park on the west side, I think that's an interesting idea because it's public lands, it won't cost, mm -hmm. um, you know, other than preparing the park, there will be no land costs involved. And I think that's a great idea. I'm excited to see how that idea progresses. So being a little innovative and creative and working with the resources that are already there exactly. a little bit more. Yes. Um, I'm 
also, okay, so parks are one thing, park space, and you're saying from what I'm hearing that there's enough park space mm -hmm. in Port Moody already. Yes. Tree canopy coverage, it's a little bit different than actual park space. Yes. What are your thoughts on um, tree canopy coverage in Port Moody? Is it good? Is it important? Why oh. should we care? It's 100% important, and I know I'm probably preaching, preaching to the converted here. Um, as we know, climate change is affecting all communities. Mm -hmm. um, Port Moody is not immune. Um, so the study that um, we, we commissioned from the consultant, which was very interesting, by the way, um, identified specific neighborhoods in Port Moody which were by their percentage of tree canopy. Right. So, for example, it found that Coronation Park has the least tree canopy in the whole city. Um, Seaview wasn't much better and so on by neighborhood. So to me that was really interesting because when they were talking about the Seaview uh, neighborhood, you know, there's a, a development slated to begin there. They've already begun de demolition and abatement and, right. and preparing for their development permits. And so what is the plan going to be for adding trees and removing trees? Are there going to be mature trees removed? Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, my personal opinion is that sometimes mature trees are too hastily removed. And why just replace, you know, trees one for one? Why aren't we, you know, kind of really working to increase that canopy, which protects us in the summer and protects us generally from, you know, climate change? It's, I mean, it's a scientific fact that tree, uh, tree canopy keeps cities cooler. And I think Port Moody has um, been doing some really good work. They have an urban tree management strategy that is in the works. And yes. I know they've done a lot of public consultation around that, which is wonderful to yes. see. So hopefully we will see that canopy coverage, you know, maintained and, and maybe increased. even increased. That's my hope. That would be wonderful. <laughs> um, beyond trees, what is what do you think is the greatest environmental challenge that uh, Port Moody is facing? right now? Oh, well, I mean, climate change affects everything, right? It affects um, the pollen release. I don't know about you, but I've, I've developed allergies in the last mm -hmm. few years, and they keep getting worse. And that's related to climate change, yes. right? Our coastal fisheries, um, the health of our oceans, our waterways, our streams, um, you know, the water is heating. That's, that's yeah. harming all of our um, marine biolife. Uh, Port Moody is fortunate to have two incredible hatcheries. Um, and, you know, they're keeping track of, you know, our fisheries and it's a struggle for them. And then, of course, there's just, you know, rainfall and these kind of extreme weather um, mm -hmm. events that we're having now all over the world, not just Port Moody. But it's to the point, you know, where um, most of us don't have air conditioning. Um, so are we going to now be looking at kind of really kind of toxic chemical ways of increasing air conditioning. Mm -hmm. um, and the city, city, thankfully, has been, you know, provides cooler spaces for people to go to on those days. Yes. But I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I think climate change is really um, the basis of a lot of our issues. Um, bears, I yes. actually, I knocked on a door of a woman last week. This was, she was so wonderful. She lives in, um, College Park, and she was concerned about all the bears coming down the mountains uh, because there's no food up there. And she right. had this idea of like, well, you know, instead of people planting trees in the summer, why don't we send a bunch of students up to plant berries and those kind of bushes mm -hmm. so they're not coming down into the city to eat. And I mean, for me, that's environmental too. I'm, a, I'm an animal lover. I've been volunteering with animal organizations my entire life. Um, it breaks my heart when conservation has to put these bears down. You know, we're we're sharing our community with them, and if we can find a way to protect their environment and ours at the same time, I think we should look to doing that. I agree 100%. I think it, it's hard when we're removing habitat and forcing them higher and higher up on That's the right. mountains where food is scarcer, right? That's so right. Um, it's a consequence that unfortunately they bear yeah. more than we do. And we've caused it. Yeah. And we've <laughs> caused it. That's right. Another thing, just circling back about um, climate change initiatives, and you're saying that more, we should be keeping more trees. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as far as with respect to climate change, 
um, trees are one of the things that municipalities really do have in their control and planting Absolutely. trees is one of the biggest ways that we can mitigate the effects of climate change. You, you mentioned the heat dome and the, how our summers are getting hotter and yeah. what better place to be than under the canopy of a tree and that's just me yeah. no, <laughs> but saying right. that but <laughs> you know and it, it's just there are things that we can do that are maybe not super, super costly. You're talking about air conditioners and, you know, the toxicity associated with that. And so, mm -hmm. you know, there are, are ways that we have to consider, we you know. We have to be creative. Yeah, Some we have to creative. be creative. Yeah. Much like that fiscal management, like you have to somehow work out a way to yeah. fit all those pieces into the puzzle. That's right. Um, there's one other area that I'd really like to touch on, sure. and I think it's something that you've identified as a priority and an issue, and mm -hmm. it's, um, well, there's two. There's uh, the issue of good governance and then respectful workplace, and we'll, yes. we'll talk about respectful workplace in a, in a, a little bit, but okay. can you tell us about good governance? Um, sure. What is it, and why is it an issue when um, we're talking about Port Moody? Like, why is it one of your priorities? So, um, you know, when I talked about my background, I didn't necessarily discuss my business background very much, but, you know, after I graduated from SFU, um, I did a degree in poli-sci history and French. Uh, I went into corporate finance, and I did that for 12 years. Um, so it was a lot of pro formas, a lot of projections, balance sheets. So that's where my interest in finance comes from mm -hmm. and understanding uh, how to balance a budget, which right. I think is very Something important. Something everybody should know. Right? We should, and cities are no different, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Now, you know, kind of, then I had my children after that, and then I went into um, the area of governance. So I've been working with boards of committees, subcommittees, um, nomination committees, governance committees, audit and finance committees now for the last seven or eight years. Um, you know, Robert's Rules of Order, the whole nine right. yards. Um, and I know what good governance looks like. I'm in meetings three times a week um, with boards, um, chairs, and, um, you know, any sort of good governing body begins with listening, mm -hmm. um, collaborating, and respect. So watching Port, Coody, Port Moody Council meetings in the last couple of years has been um, disappointing, to say the least. You know, I'm, and it, this kind of goes back to slate politics that I was discussing earlier. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of listening. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not feeling that people's opinions are being respected. Okay. You know, people are so entrenched in their in their positions before a meeting even starts that they just you know, can't wait to speak to what they want to speak to. And that's not good governance. Um, that is the opposite of good governance. Okay? Governance is about taking, you know, understanding city needs, the needs of residents, and being respectful of your colleagues. So how, how can that be changed? Like if you get on city council, how would you, how, what would you do? Like how would you work to change that sort of culture? Right. Well, I think the main thing is uh, we need to elect independent candidates. Um, and I understand that in Port Moody there is another sort of slate forming, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, which I think is unfortunate um, because I, I don't think we can endure another four years of what we've just endured and the kind of the, the infighting. But I can tell you that my own personal experience of managing uh, board committees and members, um, that is what I enjoy doing. It is not difficult to be respectful of people and mostly of their time, right? So mm -hmm. it's little things like if I want to write a report or bring something on the table in a meeting, I do that in advance. I don't bring it up at the last minute, surprise my colleagues and put them in a position where they're forced to come up with an answer on the fly. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so many little things, Nancy. Um, there aren't big answers all the time, but there's right. little things we can do to make meetings not as conflict-ridden. Right. Okay, so it sounds like you have um, somewhat of a plan to take some actions to ensure that there is good governance there. And also the other thing is respectful workplace. Yes. And we know that, you know, there's very passionate people on city council, um, you know, whether you think they're on one side or the other, there's oftentimes everybody's trying to do the best they can to reach a certain goal, but they're coming at it from different directions and maybe they, maybe they don't even have the same goals sometimes. Mm -hmm. But how, um, 
how do you think that that respectfulness can be um, sort of encouraged? And or is there a way that that can happen? So in the last four years, um, there has been a lobbying um, to establish a provincial ethics commissioner mm -hmm. to oversee elected city officials. And I think that would be a great step forward. <laughs> um, right currently, we have very little um, oversight outside right. of the city. So um, bad behavior uh, is generally unpunished and unchecked. And when you've got, you know, and when again you've got these slate majority politics happening, there's really not much that the losing end, if you want to refer to it that way, can do about it, right? Mm -hmm. um, people are passionate about Port Moody, yes. and I get it, and they should be. And, you know, regardless of what your opinions are, um, if you want no development, if you want only moderate development, I understand why you think that way. Um, but let's be respectful when we talk about it. Right. And when people get out of line, um, they need to be called on it. And if necessary, the province will have to step in. And that, I think that would be a shame if we have to get it to that level. So I'm really hoping for some fresh changes on council. Um, and hopefully, hopefully that will resolve most of the problems. Well, and I, I am aware of the integrity commissioner or the ethics commissioner <laughs> that um, there's been a lot of discussion about that lately. And it is, like you say, a third party coming in unbiased who is able to helpfully or hopefully resolve some of those issues that can't be resolved around the council yeah. table. Because I think we all agree that you can get far more done, work done, um, if it's a, a positive um, environment where everybody's voice can be heard and everybody feels comfortable. So yeah. I would like to thank you so much for coming in and talking to us today and, and helping us to get to know you a little bit better and what your priorities are should you get on, on Port Moody City Council and we'll wish you all the best, Kyla. Thanks, Nancy. It was um, a pleasure talking to you. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining We've Got Issues. We've been talking to Kyla Knowles, who is running for Port Moody City Council.